Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the Chinese podcast, The C Word. Today is Sunday, the 9th of September. Coming up in today's show, we'll be discussing the C Word, there'll be the Whipping Piccadilly section, the South Africa section, and we'll talk about the Big Five. Hello, everybody, and a big welcome to all new and returning listeners. It's lovely to have you here. I hope you're all well and you've had a good couple of weeks. You might notice that the sound levels are a little bit different on this episode of the podcast. I was going to record it earlier, last uh, earlier this week rather, and my microphone is broken, which is unfortunate because it's new. And I think there is a dry joint in the back of it where the USB connector connects in. And unfortunately, um, the resident geek of the house doesn't have his surgical soldering iron to fix it. But luckily for me, there are lots of nice people here. And I was asking whether anyone had a microphone I could borrow. And my friend knows a guy in town who owns an AV shop. And he just offered to lend me one until mine was fixed. Because you can't just order something on eBay here and it turns up the next day. That's just not how things work. So thank you, Yuppies, for lending me a microphone. It's very kind of you. You also might hear the odd rumbling of thunder in the background. It isn't a full-on storm or anything because it hasn't rained here for a long time. But there are storms forecast and I've heard the odd bit of thunder. So if there is the odd theatrical kind of horror movie sound in the background... Um, I'm afraid you're just going to have to roll with it. We don't get rain very often here, so you're in for a bit of a kind of treat in this momentous event. We've been very busy here, travelling again. We went to a place on the border with Zimbabwe and Botswana called Mapungubwe. I'm not going to talk about that in this podcast, though, because I'm going to talk about the Kruger, as I promised you last time. I've also been back at school teaching English, so... Um, her Britannic Majesty has been in nursery a bit more. So she's picking up an awful lot of Afrikaans, including mugging off her parents in Afrikaans, because every toddler's favourite word is no. But when she's saying to you, Nia, Nia, and Mina, which means no and mine, you know, you think, I can't believe my child's mugging me off in two languages, not just one. But bless her, I think she's having quite a nice time. There is another funny story about Afrikaans that I will share with you now. I realise this is the intro, but I've got onto it, so stick with me if you don't mind. And it involved when she first went to nursery. And obviously I'm trying to learn Afrikaans, I've told you before. So I've been trying to teach her, and when I went into the nursery, I would try and teach her words by speaking Afrikaans words. So one day she went to the nursery and when she very first started she was quite small and they have a book that they write all the details in and in the book there's a block for like sleeping and when they've had the milk and how many nappies they've done all that kind of trivia that you want to know about your child as a parent and there's one in there for medication because if they get ill they write down exactly what medication they've given to them so that you don't have an overdose. So one day she came home and being a good little mummy I was like looking what she'd been doing and under medication it said Gein, G-E-E-N. So I looked and I was like Gein, what's Gein? She's not on any medication. Oh no she's not on any medication but what if one of the other children are on medication and what's the medication for? I know, I'll Google it. So I Googled it and it came up with like stuff in Afrikaans for the World Health Organization, at which point my mild kind of confusion turned to mild panic. And I was sat there thinking, oh my God, oh my God, what if they've given her drugs for you know Ebola or some other African disease and she's only little and they might not given her drugs and what if she's allergic to them and what is this skin stuff anyway? And <laughs> I'm gonna ring someone who'll know. So I rang my friend, who is the lady with the dogs. The dogs are now fine, by the way, for all those of you that have been asking. And I said to her, they've wrote in the book, they've wrote in the book from nursery, and they've wrote Gein, what's Gein? What's Gein they've given? Is he Gein? And she said, Gein? What are you talking about? And I said, Gein? They've wrote under medication, Gein? And she said, can you spell it for me? So I said, G-E-E-N. And she went, 
she'll be fine. So I thought, how do you know she's going to be fine? How do you know she's going to be fine? You're not a doctor. I said, what, what is it? What is Gein? She said, in stifling laughter, she said in the phone, no, it's not Gein, it's Gein, which is Afrikaans for nothing. So they all had quite a good laugh at it because I was having a panic attack about them giving my child nothing as medication, thinking it was something really serious when it wasn't. So please, if you're in a foreign country and they've put in the boot that there is some medication, don't Google it. You'll only frighten yourself half to death. I mean, I should really have looked up what is the Afrikaans word for heart attack because that would have been more appropriate at that point. Anyway, now that the Afrikaans speaking ladies have finished drying their eyes from laughter, I'll go on to a couple of thank yous. Thank you for all of those of you that have been in touch over the past few weeks. It's really, really nice to hear from you. And I've also had a lot of people email me to offer to send me podcasts. Thank you. I wasn't moaning in the first episode that, so that you would all send me free stuff or anything like that. I was just kind of justifying my lack of podcast consumption. But it's really, really kind of you to all... There's about four or five people have offered to send me podcasts. So thank you very much. I won't mention your names now because I haven't asked whether it's okay to mention your names. But if it is, send me another email and I will mention you in the next podcast. I've also had a couple of really nice iTunes reviews. I haven't had any in the UK yet, so if the UK listeners wouldn't mind giving me one, that would be lovely. But I've had one in America from Yes I'm That Lisa, thank you very much. And I've had a South African one as well from Nitzvah Cl- Clips Cut. So thank you both very much for taking the time to give me an iTunes review. My husband, I think, thinks this is a really quirky little funny hobby that I have and that no one really listens, even though I show him that people in Benin are listening to me. (laughs) Hello, people of Benin. And I think he's taking me a bit more seriously now. I've got a couple of iTunes reviews. I'm not quite up there with Madonna yet, but there's time. There's time, people. And also, another quick reminder for those of you that missed the, the last podcast or haven't caught up yet. There's also, for podcast listeners, a 10% discount in Knitter Scarlet's Etsy shop with the code SHINYBEES. I will put another link to that in the show notes. If you're thinking about doing any Christmas shopping, being organised in September, then you might be able to make use of that and find something nice in her shop, so go take a look. And without further ado, I think it's time to crack on with the podcast. So, go and pour yourself a glass of Stellenbosch's finest, and let's get cracking. So, I thought for a change in this podcast, I would do a little attempt at a bit of an essay. So, if there's anything I'm feeling particularly inspired by in the two weeks before the podcast, then I might just give you my general state of the nation on that subject. I've noticed in the last couple of weeks that there's been a lot of chatter about the C word, as in Christmas knitting. You will be glad to hear that I'm not going to talk about Christmas knitting because I haven't started any. It's far too early for me to start. If I'm not in a blind panic on Christmas Eve knitting it or still trying to finish it in February, it's not Christmas knitting. So it's not that C word that I'm going to be talking about. It's a different C word. And it's not that other C word I'm going to be talking about, don't you worry. The C word I'm going to be talking about today is charity. A lot of people like to do charity knitting, which is a cause that I much admire. I would quite like to do charity knitting more, but I don't have time once I have done my own knitting. So, I like to support charities in a different way to that. A charity that I'm involved in at the moment is a South African one, and it's called the Santa Shoebox Project. And this charity gives shoeboxes to underprivileged children across South Africa, who would otherwise not, they've never had Christmas presents, and they would probably not get one, because their families are too poor to give them a Christmas present. It's the first year that it's going to be happening in my particular area of the country and I'm very excited. I've picked my eight children that I'm going to do. You don't have to do eight children, you can do as many or as few as you like. But I find it quite hard once you go and look at the names to not keep picking more of them. 
But I think it's a really great project because you go into the, the website and you choose the name of an actual child. So you know the name, you know how old they are, so you can build the box accordingly. And there are certain things that must be in the box, like soap and flannel and and uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, educational supplies, a toy, some sweeties, stuff like that. Really kind of basic things that most people, um, in the Western world, world at least, take for granted. And then all the boxes are collected in and given out before Christmas at a celebration. And all the kids get to take their boxes home. I'm very much looking forward to doing my boxes this year. I'm going to have a party at my house. We're going to drink a medicinal amount of wine and have some pizza. And all the kiddies are going to come around and collect and decorate their boxes as well. They also do the boxes at the school that I teach at. And I took their boxes for them last year because last year it was an hour away, the place we had to take them to. And I'm still finding sequins in the back of the car from when they decorated the boxes. And they were so excited. And I was sort of like fanning my eyes and trying not to burst into tears in front of all these children. And it's a good job really because now I'm their English teacher. And um, they really enjoyed it and they're looking forward to doing it this year as well. That's quite a difficult thing to get involved in if you're not actually in South Africa. Because you can donate money but it's very difficult to do a box. Because by the time you've sent it and they've customs charged it and everything like that. It's probably not worth doing. So what I would say is in your own countries maybe consider doing a charity project there if you don't have time to charity knit take part in some other kind of charity i quite enjoy it because i like to do nice things for people so i do it just because i i get a lot of out of doing nice things for other people everyone has different motivations for doing things for charity but it's always nice to do your little bit and if you remember a couple of months ago now the yarn harlot was doing a charity bike ride and a lot of knitters sponsored her and she raised a large amount of money for the charity she was riding for. It was very interesting hearing about her preparations for the race and doing the race and it was a long way that she rode. And she wrote a really eloquent blog post about the power of knitters, which I will link to in the show notes, that really sort of rang a bell when I read it because knitters and I'm sure you know this because you are all knitters, or most of you will be, or you will know knitters, are really, really awesome people and really kind and really generous people on the whole, which you don't often find in a lot of your hobbies. There'll always be one or two or just people who are not so nice or you never get that with knitters. Everyone's always just really nice and really generous with their time and with their help and with their friendship which I think is pretty special. And the yarn harlots, it's not my work, it's her work. Her theory behind this is that knitters know the power of every little action. Like every stitch is important. And if one stitch is wrong, the whole thing can be wrong. And knitters know that even if they do something, even though it's quite small, it could make a big impact. And they understand that, which is why they're such nice people. I think that's quite a clever way of putting things. So, thank you for that yarn harlot. I will, like as I said, I will link to that in the show notes so you can have a read of it if you haven't already. So, assuming that you do like to do charity knitting, maybe you would like to charity knit for preemies or for hospitals, or you like to charity knit blankets for old people, or the big knit for innocent drinks where you make the little hats for the drinks and they get put on to the bottles near Christmas. I think that is also opening soon in the UK. There is also another organisation that you may wish to get involved in. I'm going to get involved in it and I am going to encourage you to come and take part in the knit along. We can even have a knit along on the Shiny Bees group if you would like. And it's called Knitter Square. And this is an organisation that makes blankets for AIDS orphans, HIV orphans in South Africa and HIV and AIDS grannies because a lot of people who die of HIV AIDS in South Africa are in the kind of childbearing age group so they leave behind a lot of children who may or may not be HIV positive themselves and that's the work of looking after them is left to the grannies because the grannies aren't generally affected by AIDS because it's something that affects the younger generations. As I said it is a charity that makes blankets for grannies and orphans in South Africa and there are 1.9 million 
orphans in South Africa, which is a lot. And they really struggle, bless them. It, it, life is very hard for them. So they make the blankets to keep them warm. Because in, in the UK, if you're cold, you wear a coat. But here, you don't wear a coat. Everyone kind of walks around, particularly in the rural areas. If it's cold, like today was cold, people walk around with a blanket on. They don't have a coat. So this can help keep them warm and, and cheer them up a little bit as well. It basically involves knitting a 20 centimeter square with a 50 centimeter tail still attached on the end so that people can sew them up into blankets once they arrive here. The Knitter Square group on Ravelry, which I will link to in the show notes, also has a lot of different patterns for different other different garments. If, you, if you're massively into your charity knitted and you want to knit other garments as well, then you can do that. They also every month have like a themed knit along, so you can do just on plain squares. Plain squares are great, but if you want to do something fancy and have a bit of a theme to it, they also do that every month, which is quite cool. It's a bit interesting, especially if you do a lot of these squares. So as I said, I'll probably make a knit along thread on the group, and we can all have a nosy and see what each other is doing. I think it's a worthy cause. And I'm going to be doing a few and I'm going to rock the children in the school into a bit of child labour so they can learn how to knit, which is going to do them good, and they can make me some squares, which will also do them good. If you've got any questions or anything about how that organisation runs, it's called Knitter Square, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of all the details are on the Ravelry group and the moderators are really active and can answer all your questions and things if you do want to get involved in that. Otherwise, I encourage you to get involved in charity in your own way, in your own country, and do as much or as little as you can manage. Because as the yarn harlot says, every stitch is important, and every small action, I believe, is important as well. Much more so than doing nothing because you think what you do doesn't matter, because it definitely does matter. Because if everyone thought what they did didn't matter, then no one would do anything, and then where would we be? Okay, so that was all a bit serious sounding, really. It wasn't meant to sound serious, but I just realised afterwards I didn't make anywhere near enough jokes, but then I suppose having HIV and AIDS and being kind of destitute isn't a laughing matter. But, you know, with, with people like you and I helping, then then things are going to be better for, for these orphans. 100,000 happy hearts this year, Santa Shoebox, with any luck, so let's look forward to that. Can you hear the thunder? It's quite exciting. I'm really hoping for some rain. It's going to be awesome. If it gets too bad, I'll probably stop because we don't want this podcast to turn into some kind of weird Halloween-esque sort of horror podcast. Although it might already have, depending on how you view things. So this is the Whipping Piccadilly section, so I'd better talk about what is on and off the needles. On the needles, you will be not at all surprised to hear Damascus is still on the needles. That is a horror movie for me, frankly. It got a bit difficult around row 51 where no matter what I did and how much bodgery I did on the knitting row, the right side row, by the time I'd done the wrong side row and got back to the next one, the stitch count was wrong again. I'm not really sure what it was and a few other people from reading on the I Make Knit Along group had had similar kind of bodgery issues. They all seemed to sort themselves out around row 55 to 57 and now it is fine. I'm on row 60 odd now, but I haven't worked on it for a few days because I've been working on the socks for me instead. And I thought I would just rest it for a little bit because everything started to go fine. So I thought, no, I will, I will leave it for now because I've just gone to another nut pro and I'm going to procrastinate for another few weeks. I mean, it's not like the knit along started six months ago or anything much. So it is going well though. We will see how we get on with it in the next couple of weeks. As far as owls goes, I am knitting it, as I mentioned last time, in the British Sheep Breeds Undyed, chunky, that the pattern calls for. Um, just on the back decreases, so not again, not a lot of progress on that as such, but... Wow, the thunder's getting quite noisy. <laughs> it's quite exciting. Um, we will see how we get on with that in the next few weeks. Most of the work has been on the socks for me because I am going to enter them in the Gifted Athletes Knit Along on the Playful Day thread 
which means they need to be finished by the time the Paralympics closing ceremony takes place, which they will be. I'm decreasing the toes now, so it's not going to be a problem. Loving those, loving the yarn, nurturing fibres. And as I've described all those before, I'm not going to talk about them in any more great detail. Off the needles. You can almost count the socks for me as off the needles because they're nearly off the needles, but not quite. But in the middle of all this random big knitting, I, I decided to do a toad washcloth, which is a pattern by the Periwinkle Dragon, I think. It was done in sublime soya cotton that I had in the stash which was a DK weight it was meant to be a worsted weight yarn but I did it in DK didn't change the needle size so it's come out kind of floppy but I think that's partly because of the yarn choice as well and it's towed from Super Mario Brothers it was really fast I think I had it done in like a night more or less and at the time I was also watching Billy Connolly's Route 66 adventure I recommend the toad washcloth pattern. I don't recommend Billy Connolly's Route 66 adventure. I'm sure he was funny at some point. He's just not funny now. He's a little bit weird. He would start telling you a story and then laugh to himself. So you sit there and you think he's going to say something really funny now. And then he doesn't. So I can't say that I wasn't glad when he fell off his trike. <laughs> Which I know is a terrible thing to say. But I thought, well, that's the funniest thing that's happened the whole time. And it's a shame because the subject matter would have been very interesting, but Billy Connolly is not because he's not funny anymore. So luckily the toad washcloth cheered me up throughout that when I wasn't cursing and swearing at him and just generally wondering what he was on about. That was the only off the needles for now. In terms of the sewing, it isn't an off the needles really, is it? It's a kind of out from under the needle. I have finished the tracksuit trousers that I was doing. There was a lot of fid fiddly stuff to do with the zips to make them all neat. But now that is done. So again all I have to do is put the elastic in and they are finished. The next project will be a tracksuit top which will match the tracksuit bottoms. And I'll be drawing the pattern for that this week. So that could be quite interesting. Other than that, I am about to start work on an apron for the apron swap in the Caithness Craft Collective group. I've been paired up with a lady from America and I've picked some cool fabric that is... <laughs> I know I'm banging on about charity here and really, you know, I do apologise. But the fabric I've chosen was sold in pick and pair which we call pick and pray because you have to hope well you have to pray that the stuff that you buy is still edible by the time you get home <laughs> and it's kind of like uh, Tesco's we don't normally say the tea word on this podcast or in my house at all because I've boycotted tea shop for long and complicated reasons that I'm happy to discuss at length with you but not here and they sell these bandanas which are made out of a kind of poly cotton for leukemia charity the sunflower trust i think it's called and there was some really cool fabric there that has i don't want to say too much in case i spoil it but i've bought two of these bandanas and i'm going to make them into the apron with some other fabric so i'll put some pictures up of that when it is done and when the recipient has received her gift because i don't know if she listens to the podcast or not so i don't want to spoil it too much but I'm very pleased with myself. I think I'm doing quite well on the charity front at the moment. And I'm looking forward to making that apron as well. I have also been doing a little bit of spinning. I'm still working on the Welsh uh, Badgy Face Tall Wen Cross Texel fleece that I dye. Well, Knitter Scarlet dyed. I brought it to her from the sheep because I knew the lady that owned the sheep. And that is going quite well I just need to finish it off really so that I can go on to some merino that I was sent as part of a swap which is from Colourspun who I mentioned in the last podcast they're a South Af well she's a South African dyer and I got this really really nice red merino that I really 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 want to spin but I don't want there's a bit of a pattern I don't want to do it I want to bribe myself into finishing the yellow stuff because I'm bored of the yellow stuff I'm bored of the colour not actually spinning it, just the colour. And start doing the red stuff. But I can't, I have to try and be a bit more disciplined. So I'm looking forward to starting that once I've done the yellow stuff. 
I'm not sure whether you can hear, but it's just started to rain. It's quite loud. And it's the first time it's rained in nine months here. So you're, you're witnessing a momentous event. There is a small problem with this in that, and I, I appreciate I've gone off subject completely here, the guttering is made out of galvanised steel. Galvanised steel is not something you make guttering out of in a place where it rains often because it is extremely noisy once the rain starts to go into it. It's proper comedy kind of film rain by then. So if it starts to get too noisy, I'm going to have to stop recording because otherwise you really you won't be able to hear what I'm saying. But yeah, rain, lacquer. So without further ado, we're going to go on to the South Africa section. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast and last time, in the South Africa section this time, I'm going to talk about the Kruger National Park. I was considering getting a special guest in to help talk about it, but as the next section is going to be quite long, the Big Five section, I decided not to this time. But we will definitely have a South African next time. So if you're a South African accent junkie, then I I apologise for that. But you will get some South African accents next time. The Kruger National Park is one of the largest game reserves in Africa and it is 220 miles long from the Crocodile River in the south to the Limpopo River in the north and it is 40 miles east-west wide and it is in the Limpopo province where I live and Mpumalanga as well which is down to the southeast really of Limpopo. We went to the Kruger on the way back from our road trip after we went to Swaziland and we entered the park through the Crocodile Bridge Gate which is in the south. For the first night we stayed in Crocodile Bridge which was quite a small camp and quite quiet and then the next day we got up and drove north via Lower Sabi on the Sabi River which is a very popular camp, it's quite swanky. We stopped there to get some treats and continued north to Satara, which is where a lot of the big cats are meant to be. That was a much, much bigger camp. It was a bit more butlins than bush experience for me. But it was it was still quite nice. It was just there were a lot of people there. And we also drove the next day down the open road, which is to the west to exit by the open gate. We saw loads of animals. We saw four of the big five. We didn't see a leopard, but we saw one lion and lots of elephant, a couple of rhinos that my husband thought were boulders because I, I, I was driving, but I saw all the animals and I said, oh, what's that over there? And he said, it's just a rock. It's a boulder. And I was like, really? Do boulders have ears? At which point it was like, oh right, yeah, they don't have horns either. Because it was two rhinos sat down under a tree. <laughs> He's a bit of a blonker sometimes. And we also saw a buffalo, a big massive herd of buffalo by one of the rivers. There were lots of other things as well. We saw a wild dog, which are very, very rare. Just randomly wandering by the side of the road. Didn't manage to get a picture of that because it was too fast and ran away. But... We got a lot of pictures of other stuff and saw plenty of giraffe and hippos and crocodiles and monkeys, about a gazillion impala, which are like little deer with little swirly horns, and all manner of other bockies and whatnot too. So it was very interesting, I quite enjoyed it, and because all the vegetation has died back it was quite easy to spot things and the animals come to the watering holes to get water because they can't get it anywhere else because it's so dry. Inspired by the Kruger visit, I decided that we needed a knitting Big Five. In one of my comedy moments, I decided that why why do we not review knitting Big Five? So, you'll hear me flash my notes a little bit now. I went to the pattern selection in Ravelry, to the search function, and decided, yeah, 
why don't we have a look at the Knitting Big Five? So, for your listening pleasure, and possibly, <laughs> questionably, your viewing pleasure, if you could t- go and check out these patterns on Ravelry, here is the Shiny Bees Knitting Big Five. So I thought I would start off with something easy and I went for the elephant. There are lots and lots of elephant patterns so I decided to narrow it down as far as possible. I have a free pattern for you and a paid for pattern where I could find two worth recommending. (laughs) The elephant was much easier than some of the other animals in the big five, the reasons for which will become obvious as I get onto them later. I've just suddenly become aware that I'm doing that Billy Connolly thing where I'm laughing to myself and then not giving you a punchline. I'm not going to apologise for it. You will laugh along with me in a little while. So, the first pattern I have for you is an elephant pattern. It is the Elephant Hat Child Size by Kathleen Taylor. And it is a kid's beanie that's knitted from the bottom up in the round. And it is a kind of fair owl looking beanie with little elephants on it it's very very cute that is a free pattern so I will link to that in the show notes and I will link to all the other patterns I'm going to mention in the show notes as well the paid for pattern that I picked is a pair of socks called Elephants in Stripes by Erky Gerky I don't know if that's how you pronounce it that's a cool name and these are knitted to toe up on two circular needles it specifies in the pattern that you need to know Judy's Mastic uh, Judy's ma- mas- magic cast on sorry she doesn't cast on with that plastic stuff you put around windows and you need to have done stranded knitting and purling before and toe up socks before but these are really pretty colour work elephant socks they're quite tasteful in terms of animal themed knitted garments I would say I quite fancy having a go at it but it looks a bit hard as well so I don't know whether I will get around to it or not the pattern costs 6 US dollars Then I decided we must move on to the lion. A lion's going to be easy, surely. There are quite a lot of Gryffindor-based patterns, so if you're into your Harry Potter, you are in luck. I didn't choose one of those. I chose the Lion Hat by Susanna, which is spelled Z-S-U-Z-S-A-N-N-A, Hoffa is her surname, designs, and she, this is a paid-for pattern, and it's five US dollars. The reason I picked it is because it's a fancy dress hat for a lion. You know, say your child was in a play and they were the lion in The Wizard of Oz, then this would be entirely appropriate. But (laughs) the small small child wearing the hat does not look impressed at all that he's got this hat on. Like I said, it'd be really good for fancy dress or costuming. Not so much for small child going out with his mates or generally making him wear it and saying, sit still while I take a picture, bud. So I just find the kid really funny, which is why I've picked that. Not the best reason to pick a pattern, but it works for me. Another paid for pattern you may wish to uh, give some consideration to is the Lion Dog Sweater by Marsha McCormack. Why people feel the need to dress their dogs up as wild beasts I have no idea and it only seems to happen to small dogs I feel very sorry for small dogs you can get it in a smaller medium and a large size up to miniature dachshund size the dachshunds the Vorshi dogs come into it again I don't personally agree with dressing my dog up as a lion But if you feel the need to do so, I'm sure the pattern is very well written. It looks like a nice little lion sweater. Don't really think you should be dressing your dog up as a lion. I'm quite aware that some dogs need to be kept warm in winter because it gets a bit cold. But don't make them look stupid. It's just so unfair. They're already a small dog. You don't need them to be laughed at any more in the dog park than they already are. But (laughs) if you want a free version of that for your dog... You can look at the King of the Beasts dog sweater, which is one done by Lion Brand Yarn, unsurprisingly. The dog on this, again, chosen because the subject looks so annoyed. He looks really sad, bless him. It's a little Westy and he's looking at the camera as if to say, I know I look stupid. Please.
please feel sorry for me. Don't knit this for your dogs. I'm not going to be knitting either of these for the Shelties, but if you want to make your do dog look a little bit daft, then feel free. There are some other ones of this genre that you can find on there and, and knit to your heart's content if you're that way inclined. Then we moved on to the Rhino. The pattern I picked for this was a rhino, the Rhino pattern by Linda Dawkins, who is a South African lady. She runs an awesome blog, Natural Suburbia, where she writes about all sorts of stuff and she has loads of really, really nice patterns for little toys and things. This one is knitted in iron weight and it is $5.50. Which sounds expensive for a toy pattern, but a dollar of each pattern sale goes to stop rhinoporching.com because rhino porching is a really big problem in South Africa and they're trying very hard to deal with it. But it's very difficult to police areas as large as the Kruger, for instance, that is it's just so, so huge. It's very difficult to be able to keep an eye on all the poachers because it's just so difficult to police. So that's a really good charity, I think to uh, give a pound of, oh, sorry, a dollar of your knitting money to. Or there is a crochet pattern on this one, because it made me laugh. It's called Rinka the Rhino, which is a faux taxidermy head. It's a crocheted rhino head that you can put on your wall and pretend you shot it, but obviously you didn't because it's crocheted and made of yarn. So that is $5. I'm actually tempted, I really am tempted to to, to crochet this. It's done on a three and a half millimetre hook, so I'm not sure how long it would take. And it is by Sandra J. Dobroshalev. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Probably not. But it's really nice actually in a kind of cookie sort of way. I think you will quite like it. So for you crocheters out there, that's one for you. Also a knitting paid for pattern in the Rhino front was the Rhino Crew Neck by Gail Pfeiffer. We again can't read my own writing. It's six dollars, and that is another jumper. It's an intarsia sort of crew neck jumper that looked quite cute as well. So I've chosen that for that reason, not because the subject looks hilarious. Then it starts to get a bit difficult because when you go on to leopard, it is very difficult not to find something tacky. Go into the pattern search on Ravelry, type in leopard and you will see exactly what I mean. So I was a bit pushed on the leopard front. So I went with another dog sweater. It's called the Sexy Beast Dog Sweater. Again, dogs all over the country are crying now because I am telling you this. I'm sure my two Shelties are sat at home with the paws over their ears thinking, please, no, do not knit one of these for me. Mother-in-law, do not knit one for the dogs. They do not need one. If you need a knitting project, tell me. I have lots of cardigans I would like for HBM that you can knit instead. There's a very sad-looking Yorkshire Terrier wearing the sexy beast dog sweater. It's done by my Savannah Cottage and it's $6 for those of you who would like to knit a sexy beast dog sweater. If you want a free pattern, this one is quite cute. It's called Uptown Girl by Shelley D. Jones. And it's a little beanie for a little girl. And instead of being in the usual leopard print colours, it's in white and red and pink. And that looks quite cute. That's actually quite tasteful. So that's a possibility for me if I'm going to go for the big five. And finally, we get onto the buffalo. Starts to get very difficult on buffalo. There's certainly not really any African buffaloes in there. But there are Wild West buffaloes. So the paid pattern I went for was the Wild West Lace Shawl by Evelyn Clark Designs. And this one's actually quite nice. It's $7.95. And it is a lace shawl. It's top down, triangle shaped. And it's got, in the, the pattern of the lace, it's got little buffaloes. But they're not very obvious buffaloes. You can only, once you look at it, tell the buffaloes when it's called the Wild West Lace Shawl and tagged with buffaloes. So it's, it's quite nice. Have a look at that one. I'm not going to knit it because shawls take me too long. I'm sort of falling out with shawls. Certainly lace weight shawls. But it's something to give some consideration to. Or, free, you have Ooming Mouse by Kristin... I, I don't know if it's Godet or Hoadet. 
but it is a knitted pattern from winter 2008 and these are some felted slippers which look quite cool so you could give them a try also that is my big five I found after I wrote the notes today another elephant one which was very cute it's called Ella Funt spelt E-L-L-A space F-U-N-T and it's this really cute cardigan which has around the yoke a little fair not fair isle colour work elephants put into it little teeny ones but very tasteful elephants they're not un, you know they're nice elephants they're not gaudy elephants very very cute very cute child model mother-in-law this is something that would be suitable for HBM if you wish to knit it I'm sure you are listening because you're quite nosy luckily I have a very good bantery relationship with my mother-in-law she's a very nice lady and she also knits she knits these awesome Christmas stockings but that's a whole other story so have a look at those patterns let me know what you think about the big five the knitted big five if you enjoy this feature I can cover all manner of other knitted animal patterns if you would like so that brings us on neatly to the end of the show I hope you've enjoyed it and enjoyed your listen I've certainly enjoyed talking to you and I hope that the changing microphone hasn't put you off too much hopefully mine will be fixed again soon and I can record on that although it might take a couple of weeks so the next podcast might also be with this microphone if you would like to get in touch it would be lovely to hear from you as always and you can get in touch via Ravelry where I am Shiny Bees and there is also the Shiny Bees podcast group if you would like to come and join that I am Shiny Bees on Twitter you can email me at shinybeesinfo at gmail.com or you can leave a comment on the blog which is shinybees.wordpress.com if you enjoy the show enough you can always leave me an iTunes review which would be very nice and prove to my husband that I'm not a complete mentalist so from me I hope you all have a great week happy crafting and I look forward to speaking to you again soon bye you've been listening to the shiny bees podcast show notes for the podcast can be found on the blog at shinybees.wordpress.com positive itunes recommendations are always welcome and very gratefully received Thank you.